Yeah, so my name's Sam Burden, and uh, I left the group not too long ago, within the last year, to start as an assistant professor up at the University of Washington in Seattle in electrical engineering. It's a bit of a homecoming for me because I did my undergrad there as well, so that's been a real, uh, a lot of fun. It's a real pleasure to be here in the presence of so many friendly faces, and it's a real honor to be speaking in uh, such a prestigious uh, stage. Um, so thanks very much for your time. Uh, so what I thought I'd talk about is basically kind of my, just cover my transition from my last year here at Berkeley, the last project I worked on with Shankar, to then the work that I'm continuing at UW and the connections between them. And the overarching theme, since this was supposed to be a little bit of like a futures perspective, is moving towards providing some kind of formal guarantees when humans are in the loop in control systems or cyber physical systems. And the launching off point uh, for my, my work is the same video that Aaron says shows up in every single robotics talk, which is actually completely accurate. Uh, so I don't need to dwell on this entirely, but I just want to make the point that robots really lack full autonomy. It's just this, this uh, you know, there were amazing collection of teams with huge numbers of resources competing in this DARPA robotics competition. And even though there were some really striking successes I'll highlight at the end, it's still the case that these things can't move around to accomplish their own tasks completely on their own. So a kind of natural solution to this problem might be to uh, amp up the level of human involvement and basically rely on the human as a teleoperator controlling the system. So from a, you know, control theorist point of view, we basically want to uh, have the human providing the motor inputs to the system and then sending back sensory feedback. And in reality, like from my strictly very mathematical control theorist point of view, what we're trying to do is basically include the human in our block diagrams, put a little block around the person and then figure out what their input output characteristics are, how we can actually engineer around, closed loops around them. And the kinds of uh, applications that we might have in mind for something like this, the kinds of things that have been put it in B in my bonnet the last couple of months, are situations where you know, we really can't rely on slow, uh, quasi-static robot locomotion. We really have to push the envelope and make these things dynamic and accomplish tasks in you know, uh, operationally uh, realistic timelines. So the kinds of motivation is, you know, why it's kind of insane if you think about it at an abstract level, when there's a disaster, when there's like a forest fire or something, the first thing we do is we put more people into that situation. And the reality is we have to do that at this point, but in the future, we should totally just pull those people out and have put machines in their place that you know, we don't mind as much. Uh, it's just a, an economic and not a uh, uh, ethical cost to lose those people. Um, but this is clearly still out of reach at the moment, but this is the kind of thing that I wanna push towards. And there's a fundamental challenge here in that when we integrate humans in the loop with CPS, there are now more than one decision-making agent. And they're interacting with not some sort of static, it's not like a user interface UX kind of problem, you know, not improving the interface in Facebook. There's, there's really an underlying dynamical complex world that these agents are interacting with. And if you naively sort of blithely just inject the automation into the loop with the human or vice versa, you can get some kind of scary outcomes. So a lot of people have probably seen this video, kind of acclimate you to it if you haven't seen it before. Basically, this is one of these fancy Tesla cars. And now, it's, this is not so recent now, maybe almost a year ago, Tesla rolled out this software update that enabled autonomy on their a huge subset of their fleet of vehicles. And then immediately these really scary YouTube videos started popping up where people are basically, humans are deciding to enable this, these autonomous controllers in situations where they really haven't been tested that thoroughly and they really shouldn't be active, right? But this is the decision that the person makes because, hey, they have access to this cool toy. So basically, the car's under kind of autonomous operation. It's not clear whether it gets confused because of the lighting, you know, the shadows are kind of tough. It's, maybe it's trying to track that car that's going up around the corner. But the point is that this combination, naively sort of embedding humans in the midst of automation can lead to these pretty tragic or scary kinds of outcomes. Fortunately, in that case, it, it wasn't uh, a crash. And this is not a new concept or challenge. The aerospace industry has been dealing with this for decades. They have this notion of pilot-induced oscillations. If, uh, you know, the neurophysiological delay that's characteristic of human pilots, if you fail to take that into account when you're designing your high performance, you know, your jet controller or something like that, autopilot subsystems, then you can get adversarial coupling and it can lead to crashes of test aircraft, which has happened a bunch of times. And then the more recent problem that's being highlighted in the Tesla example is this over-reliance on these enhanced safety features that are being rolled out into our vehicles, whether we like it or not. And kind of an interesting statistic, and I don't know whether this will, uh, this kind of thing will go up, this trend will go up or down in the coming years, but it, for late model Mercedes, 
the Insurance Agency Consortium of the US did a study, and it should be more expensive to insure your vehicle if you have a lane departure warning system. Basically, you were statistically, last year, more likely to be in an accident if your car had that system than if it didn't. So I think this is a beautiful example where, you know, from an engineer point of view, this seems like, well, this is an obvious thing. Yeah, this is definitely going to enhance safety, but if, if you fail to take into account the way that drivers actually respond to these systems, then you can actually cause more accidents than you prevent. And, you know, these, these performance losses could range from, you know, maybe I just expend a little bit more fuel, or it could really be something bad, like a crash that injures or causes deaths or things like that. And so my perspective on this is that, you know, looking at this from the control theory point of view, this closed loop that we have, the observation is that if we intervene, if we design a control system or an automated, you know, CPS kind of application that intervenes in this control loop, then we've essentially varied this sensor or motor loop. And so if we want to be able to ensure safety or provide any kind of formal guarantees, we need predictive models for how these kinds of loops get closed. And so the point of the talk today is to just to highlight some of the recent work that I've done in, now I'm realizing, a very limited amount of time, uh, trying to <laughs> develop predictive dynamical models for these sensor or motor problems. Uh, one aspect that I've been focusing on uh, that I spent my last year here at Berkeley working on is trying to develop internal models for the way people control complex dynamical systems. And then I'm also interested in tackling this from the other end. So if I'm thinking about this robot, this legged robot teleoperation problem I talked about at the beginning, I also want to simplify those dynamics on the other end of the sensor motor loop as much as possible. So in the limited amount of time, I'm basically just going to be able to give you the highlights of this before kind of trying to bring it together at the end. And so I'll just bl blitz through this first topic on internal models. Basically, our, our uh, starting off point was to realize that there's actually a very deep scientific literature trying to model the way that humans behave and make decisions and interact with systems. And so we want to draw on some of that wisdom. And so we kind of looked at it and we said, well, there's this pretty powerful, pretty general theory of forward and inverse models that say that, you know, somewhere embedded in my brain, if I want to, uh, you know, reach and pick up a cup or something like that, I have some forward model, some prediction of the effect that my motor commands are going to make on the sensory data that's coming back to me. And I may, in order to synthesize those motor actions to accomplish a goal, I may try to, in some sense, invert those dynamics or invert that forward model. And uh, in fact, if I, you know, pairing these models, there seems to be a lot more evidence that this is what's actually going on in people, and it has really wonderful parallels uh, in the kinds of areas that we're more accustomed to, control theory, robotics, AI, you know, these notions of uh, internal model principle, uh, these model learning and things like that. And so we thought that this would be a really nice interface for rapprochement between these, you know, initially very disparate kinds of disciplines. So I'm not going to be able to go into a lot of the technical details. Suffice to say that, uh, you know, a lot of the existing literature had dealt with the case of a forward model that's just a static map. They didn't consider dynamics because they were just trying to, you know, make progress on the kinds of problems they were interested in. And when you try to generalize to a dynamical system or a control system, the problem gets a little bit more challenging. But if we, make, if we impose some kind of natural assumptions that we're used to imposing about, you know, constant relative degree and things like that, these are the technical details I'm going to quickly gloss over, but of course I'd be happy to chat with anybody about during the breaks. But basically, you know, we start with a pretty general nonlinear control system. We impose our kind of general, uh, our, our commonly accepted relative degree condition, then we get simpler dynamics. In, those, in that simpler form, it's really clear how to invert the dynamical model. So now we have a candidate for, under the hypothesis, if the person is doing forward and inverse modeling to control a system, now we have a hypothesis, and I can just write out algebraically the formula for what I expect the person to do. And so what we're interested in thinking about is what are the consequences of the person actually doing that. One funny thing is that uh, performing, I mean, essentially doing feedback linearization. And we know that feedback linearization renders the zero dynamics unobservable. So this seems like a problem from the point, point of view of controlling a system. If the human is doing forward and inverse modeling, and now they've rendered the state of the system unobservable, it seems unlikely they'll ultimately be able to control it. So there are a lot of different ways to get around this, a lot of different, you know, corner cases one could prove, but a kind of general condition is if the person's interacting with a stable system that is stably invertible, then it kind of doesn't matter that they don't know the actual system's state. They can basically proceed as if they knew it. They can have a virtual model in their head of what the system's doing. They can use that, the model that they synthesize based on that to uh, 
to invert their dynamics, and that will actually, you know, mathematically, invert the physical system that they're trying to control. So pictorially, it doesn't really matter whether there's a discrepancy in initial conditions. If the forward and inverse models are stable, then the person can just use their internal model to actually control both systems. And uh, we had a paper on this that recently appeared. This is joint work with Dexter Scobie, who's in the back there, and uh, a postdoc that I have at UW named Brian Robinson. And then there's kind of an interesting further application we can make for this, and this gets partially back toward this theme of trying to do provably safe interventions. Under the hypothesis that the person is doing model inversion, if we observe the way they're controlling the system, then the automation can actually make a change to its internal dynamics and get a prediction of the consequence of that. So basically, under the assumption that the person's doing this, pairing this forward and inverse models, the optimization could look, or the automation could look at what the human's doing, solve an optimal control problem, and then that alteration to the sensor motor loop will actually be provably safe in the sense that they will, after relearning the modified dynamics, return to their preceding behavior, which was already safe in the context of the system. So that's our kind of initial uh, result in the direction of getting guarantees when we alter the sensor motor loop between a human and a, and a teleoperated robot. So now I'm going to quickly switch topics. I have plenty of time to, uh, to dive into uh, some of my other work. This really builds on what I spent most of my PhD working on, which is now getting lumped into this general term of Terra dynamics. If you're not familiar with this term, don't worry. It's not uh, in co totally common parlance yet. A lot of the physicists don't really accept that this is an actual discipline yet. But if you think about it, you know, we're very familiar with hydro and aerodynamics, where you have a locomotor through, that's just immersed in a fluid. And every single motion is always interacting with the propulsive media that's taking you through the air or the water. Um, but in legged locomotion, the situation's fundamentally different. And I just highlighted, I like to work both on robotic systems as well as study natural biomechanical systems like leaping lizards, things like that. And fundamentally, you can see that the forces developed here come, uh, are fundamentally different and they change very rapidly when different subsets of limbs are in contact with the ground. So from a, in a mathematical point of view, we have this intermittent interaction and if we want a simple or par parsimonious model for these kinds of systems, we're naturally kind of led to, uh, to hybrid dynamical systems where mathematically my dynamics, my accelerations, and uh, sometimes my velocities change abruptly whenever I have a change in the contact configuration of the limbs. So if you accept this kind of, uh, this kind of assertion I'm making that these parsimonious models, not necessarily first principles a priori, but you know, descriptive useful models are going to be piecewise defined, that's the premise for the rest of this section. And so under this premise, we can make an additional kind of funny observation, which is that it's actually very common, in, especially in biological systems with multiple legs, for several impacts to happen at almost exactly the same time. So I'm showing here a horse that's trotting. Your dog will canter or pace. Uh, cockroaches do a funny thing where they, ha they group triplets of legs and move them in synchrony. And partly as a consequence of the fact that animals do this, there's a lot of robots that do similar things. So here's a Rex robot from Dan Kodacek's group at UPenn that I collaborate a bit with, doing an alternating tripod. You can have a quadruped that's bounding, things like that. And so this really made me, uh, motivated me and a few of my collaborators to focus on this situation in these piecewise defined models when you have intersections of multiple guards, that's the formal definition or formal characterization of this, or anyway, when you have multiple legs that are slapping on the ground at the same time, that's the kind of colloquial interpretation. And there's a funny thing that happens, if you dig into the literature, there are a bunch of examples where people have looked at this, and there's a funny thing, which is that if you build, depending on how you build your robot, the mathematical model, the parsimonious model of these simultaneous impact situations might be kind of pathological. It might have some mathematical problems that make it difficult to work with. And so an example is, of this is if I grab something with a rigid kinematic hand, where I have a bunch of rigid links connected with rigid joints. So if I'm holding onto an object like my mouse here with a couple of digits, and then a new digit comes in and impacts at non-zero velocity, there's actually a subset, it's, there's a theorem that says that a subset of the limbs that were already in contact with the digits have to pop off. And exactly which subset have to pop off, it depends on who you trust, whether you, for your impact models, do you trust Poincaré or Legendre or Newton or Lagarde, or whatever. And so, in fact, our mathematical models aren't even really well defined in those contact, or those kinds of simultaneous contact kind of configurations. The analogous thing holds in the case of locomotion. There was a cool recent study that showed that, got one, basically? Less than one. Um, Suffice to say that these were interesting things that we wanted to take a look at. 
Uh, and what we found is that just by changing the way that you design or you model your system, you basically introduce viscoelasticity, you can resolve some of these issues. So you can basically mathematically get some computation that doesn't happen in the case of rigid limbs, um, and you get these consistent terahead dynamics. We have some interesting theorems as a consequence of that. I'm definitely going to skip through all of those, and I just want to get back to this original theme, you know, the, in the DARPA Robotics Challenge, I don't want to totally trash the results of the DARPA Robotics Challenge because in a lot of ways, the results were really remarkable. You know, once the robot was able to get to its task, it was able to complete some, you know, coordinate 36 degrees of freedom to complete some really interesting fine motor control manipulation tasks, drive vehicles, things like that. But if we want to work in these application domains that I'm interested in, these really, you know, where operational tempo is really a crucial criteria, we need to move toward dynamic telemanipulation or telelocomotion. And so these are the kinds of problems I'm, I'm getting really interested in now. Bridging these two pieces of the work that I did most recently and uh, what constituted the majority of my PhD work. So the parting shot that I'll, I'll leave you with is this idea that as we increasingly automate the physical world that people interact with, I think that we don't want to just completely remove and cut out the person and, and neglect them and leave them behind, but we want to leverage them to the extent possible as the ena enabling technology, regardless of the application domain. So thanks very much for your time. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, so while our next speaker sets up, uh, any quick questions? Uh, I'll ask you. Sure. So on the, I mean, the premise that you have, uh, the premise that there's this input-output relationship, you know, vis-a-vis -vis feedback linearization for the human. Is there any evidence that perhaps it's more, I'm going to be biased here, Lyapunov, where instead of a specific control law, it's some family of control laws that may not be explicitly defined? That's a super interesting question, and I don't have any, uh, I don't necessarily have an a priori reason to think that, you know, that people are doing feedback linearization necessarily. Uh, I have a little bit of, uh, you know, experimental weight thrown behind this argument in that um, the, you know, this community, the scientific community of motor control, people studying human motor control, have proposed this forward and inverse model thing. And the funny thing is that the structure of the inverse model we get, you know, I derive it mathematically using feedback linearization, but it's actually forced on you just by the assumption of doing forward and inverse modeling. And so, you know, what the person does off of the nominal kind of optimal trajectory, you know, may be driven by some other kinds of control mechanisms, but the actual, like, feed forward input that they should be applying is forced on you by that assumption. If that makes sense. All right, well, thank you very much, Sam. One more round of applause, please.